This is the world's longest underwater road and rail tunnel, and it's currently being constructed in the Baltic Sea. But how on earth are they managing to dig an 18 kilometer trench underwater, build 89 of these massive tunnel elements, and move and submerge them with such incredible precision? This is literally the biggest construction site in Europe, and yet most Europeans don't even know that this tunnel could soon change the way they travel across the continent. Hey, I'm your host Regis, and today we're going to take a deep look at the Femarn Belt Tunnel. For decades, all member states of the European Union have enjoyed the benefits of having one single market. This has allowed for free movement of people and goods, as well as services and capital. But many of these EU states still lack proper transportation networks and operations between their borders, which makes movement between these countries slower than anyone would like. Take the Rhine Alpine Corridor, one of the busiest freight routes in Europe that connects the Netherlands to Italy via Germany. On this route, cargo trains are frequently delayed because they have to wait for high-speed passenger trains to use the tracks first. This phenomenon of trains needing to wait for others to pass is commonly referred to as a bottleneck, and there are a couple of these along the Rhine-Alpine corridor. There's also the existence of single-track rail sections. In North Germany, these sections also make it hard for trains to pass each other, meaning that they sometimes have to wait for oncoming traffic to clear before moving along. This ends up causing delays in cross-border travel from Scandinavia to Central Europe across these sections. The European Union, however, has come up with a solution to address all of these in-state and cross-border travel problems, and they're calling it the Trans-European Transport Network, or in short, 10T. This proposed solution is basically a series of transport networks made up of railways, roads, airports, and water infrastructure spanning across the European Union. Some of the megaprojects included in the 10T initiative are the Rail Baltica, which will connect Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia to the European Rail Network. There's also the Brenner Base Tunnel that aims to better connect Austria with Italy through the Brenner Pass in the Alps. The idea behind these networks is to close any infrastructure gaps and to ensure better trade and transportation. In 2013, the network's nine core corridors were announced, and one of these corridors is called the Scandinavian Mediterranean Corridor. Also simply called the ScanMed Corridor, it's the longest of the nine 10T core network corridors. Its connectivity stretches from Helsinki to Valletta on these three axes. Part of this corridor project is building a faster and better connection between Central Europe and Scandinavia, and this is where the Femarn Belt Tunnel makes its grand entrance. The uh, Femarn Belt Crossing is an 18 kilometer immersed combined road and rail tunnel between Denmark and Germany, or a bit more precise, in between the islands of Lolland on the Danish side and Femarn on the German side. This is Marcus Just, an engineer on this mega project who was kind enough to tell us all about it. My name is Marcus Just. I work as construction area manager for Femarn, the future owner of the Femarn Belt Crossing. My main area is the, the outfitting of the future tunnel elements, and I work on the in the production facility on our big uh, production area for the elements for the for the tunnel. This tunnel will be used by cars, trains, and trucks once it's completed in 2029. The location of the tunnel will allow for a better connection between Germany and Denmark by removing an existing bottleneck and speeding up travel time. Right now, only car ferries operate across the Femarn Belt, and it takes somewhere around an hour to complete this journey. When this tunnel is finished, the same journey will only take 7 minutes by train and 10 minutes by car. It'll also boost the link between Scandinavia and Central Europe, and by moving freight from road to rail and using electric trains, this tunnel will be a greener and more sustainable means of railway transportation. But how exactly are they building this insanely long underwater tunnel? It's basically built up in various big parts. So the first big bit was the digging of the tunnel trench. So uh, we're finished with that one. So all the trench is ready for the elements to be immersed. To excavate this underwater trench with such precision, they used big excavation ships that can dig out trenches at deep depths. And it's really done with, with very high precision that is provided with, we have set up monitoring points or, or survey points on both sides of the belt. So they can always relate to that one. And then via satellite and GPS and all these measures, 
the operator of the equipment exactly knows where the backhoe is exactly in depth and therefore we can or our contractor could provide us a tunnel trench with very very high precision. With such a big trench underwater I wouldn't be surprised if it gets filled up with sediment again after a while but that's actually not a problem at all. You can think of their method for keeping the trench clean kind of like using a giant vacuum cleaner. We will do a sort of so-called trench cleaning so we will clean the trench before we then come with the foundation so with the gravel bed foundation and finally the element but it is not there is not much i mean there's no tide in this area the current is manageable we have very stiff soils so the tunnel trench is in fact not really filling up that much it needs to be cleaned yes but it's not big amounts it's just sort of a bit bit of housekeeping to be done before we can come in with, with the foundation and the element and to build such a huge underwater mega tunnel, a factory had to be constructed where the tunnel elements could be built and transported to their location in the Baltic Sea. This factory is considered the largest tunnel factory in the world, and each tunnel element being built here is 217 meters long, about 42 meters wide, and 9 meters tall. So we have a big factory with six production lines for elements. So we, we produce these immersed tunnel elements on land in big production halls, and these production halls were purpose-built for the project, um, including not only the halls, but also big basins, which basically function as a lock to to bring the elements from land into the water. Then we have a very big harbor. The third biggest harbor in Denmark was built just for this project. The harbor and factory is strategically located next to where the tunnel elements need to be immersed. This is not only more practical, but it'll also save a lot of time in moving the elements from the factory to the water. Another big challenge involved is building the tunnel portals, which are basically the entrances to the tunnel. The two tunnel portals have already been built, one in Denmark near Rodbeihaven and one in Germany near Puttgarden. So the first part of the tunnel is built in situ. In situ means very, very traditional. You, you just dig a hole, you place the tunnel and you fill the hole up again. So this we do with the first uh, few hundred meters of the tunnel. In order to do that, obviously we needed a dry area to do that. So you build a temporary dike into the belt, providing you a working area that sticks out into the water. That dry area then then excavate. You place the tunnel, the first bit of the tunnel. Once that is done, you place the final dam or the final dike over the tunnel. By removing the outer dike, a piece of the tunnel will be sticking into the water. This part of the tunnel will be the connection point where the first tunnel elements can then be immersed. All in all, the Femarn Belt Tunnel will be made up of 89 humongous pre-built tunnel elements, with each section so big and so heavy that they weigh more than 13,000 elephants. But how are these tunnel elements actually being put together? The production of the elements can almost be described as an as a assembly line production. We start at the very beginning to assemble the reinforcement cage. What he's referring to here is using steel inside the concrete to reinforce it. This reinforcement cage is assembled, starting with the base plate, then attaching the walls, and then finally adding the top slab. Once that is done, this cage is pushed forward. So obviously the production facility is always at the same spot and the tunnel elements are sort of pushed through the whole production. So once we have this reinforcement cage, it's pushed forward to where we cast this segment. Now, we don't cast the whole tunnel element, the whole 270 meters in one go. This tunnel element is built up in nine segments. So we always build one segment at a time. So we build one roughly 25 meter long piece at a time. So once, as said, the reinforcement cage is done, it gets pushed forward with big hydraulic pushers to the area where we cast. The casting itself can be very challenging, as it takes more than 30 hours to cast just one segment, and the conditions have to be just right. That's also still, the first part at least, is still inside the halls because we have controlled conditions. There is roughly the same temperature all the time. There's no wind, there's no rain, there's no snow. So we have these controlled conditions to get a really good product in the end. It's very challenging casts and the control conditions make it easier to really achieve the product we want and need. Once the casting is finished, the segment goes on to the curing area. Once we have nine 
of these 25 meter steps, nine of these segments cast, we have one full element. This full element is then pushed forward outside in the so-called outfitting area, which is also the upper basin of the lock. Um, once there, it needs to be outfitted. So there's a lot of things, even though the elements look ready, they're far from being ready. There's a lot of things that need to go in. We need bulkheads at the front and the back in order to make the element watertight so it'll, it'll float, it'll swim. And although the factory is close to where these parts need to be immersed, it's still very challenging to transport them to the water. We need to press the segments together in order to be able to transport it. So if you have nine separate pieces and you would just try to lift that at the bottom, the, at the front, at the end, it would just collapse, right? So basically the same as trying to transport nine books and you're only allowed to touch the first and the last one, you press those books together, then you can lift it, you can place it somewhere else, and once you place it again, you can release it. Okay, but what about the immersion process itself? How exactly do they do it? Well, Marcus explained to us that they use basins built in front of the factory to transport the elements for immersion. First, the upper basin is filled with water so the element can float on the surface and be moved through the lower basin to the work harbor. There, an immersion pontoon is connected to each end of the element. A pontoon is a flat-bottomed boat that uses floats to retain its buoyancy. These immersion pontoons help to hold the element above the water while transporting it to its destination in the femarn belt. To immerse these colossal elements, the immersion pontoons will steadily lower and place them in the tunnel trench using steel wires. At its lowest point, the Femarn Belt Tunnel is around 40 meters below sea level. It'll take an estimated three years to position all 89 elements. Of course, to build a tunnel like this out in the water, the project has an entire fleet to help them with their operations. They have tugboats that transport the finished elements with their immersion pontoons to the immersion area, and there are also other types of pontoons that were specifically made for this project. One of the pontoons will be used once these elements are fitted into the tunnel trench. So, I mean, the tunnel trench is not exact snug fit for the element. Obviously, it has inclined edges. So we will end up with some areas left and right of the tunnel element that will later have to be filled with sand. That is done by the Bretsch Spreader Pong Tong, also custom equipped Pong Tong for the, for the project. The last pontoon that will be used is called the Protection Layer Pontoon, and it'll add a protective layer on top of the tunnel once it's in place. This will protect the underwater tunnel from any dropped ship anchors or potential sunken ships. And then, of course, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of other ships that need to be there, crew, transport. We have multi-cats that's, that's sort of work ships that can handle anchors or can handle whatever needs to be handled, access shafts. There is, there's a big fleet of ships that are necessary to have these operations running. Building at these depths definitely isn't easy, and that's why everyone follows pretty strict procedures and instructions. A lot of redundancy in all the operations we're doing offshore. So it can only be done within a certain weather window. Every winch, every anchor is has a redundancy. If, if something really should go wrong, there's always a fallback scenario. All these processes are uh, trained, so we have simulations, and we're doing simulations for the, both the transport and the immersion. With all the tugboat captains, with the immersion pontoon captains, with all the responsible, they are well trained. The equipment is tested to the max, so we are sure that the winches can do what they're supposed to do. That the procedure really can be done as intended. So the Femarn Belt Tunnel is going to close a pretty big bottleneck in the European rail system. It'll create a faster connection between Hamburg and Copenhagen and reduce train travel from five hours to two and a half, something that Marcus definitely looks forward to. It is the project I always wanted to work on. I'm German. I'm from the south of Germany. I studied in Hamburg and while studying, I was here on Fehmarn and I was like, whenever we build this connection, I want to be part of this. Now I'm part of it. Um, it's connecting my old home, Germany, with my new home, Denmark. I live in Denmark now. So for me, it's just very personally, very special. So what do you think? Does Europe really need such a big tunnel? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.